So I'm John Demang. Um, thank you very much for all of you for coming here. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, I'm the director of the uh, Knowledge and Media Institute at the Open University, which acts like a corporate R&D centre. The OU has 175,000 students, and my job is to create new technologies which may be useful to them. My role here tonight is the warm-up act for the main event. So I'm going to try and explain what blockchains are in 30 minutes. I assume that you know nothing, okay? So I, I'll start from the very beginnings. So, and I must say, I'm a, um, an enthusiast, so uh, um, I'm going to have a very positive spin. So I'll, I'll talk about uh, um, the impact of blockchains as I see them. Um, uh, I'll talk about the Ethereum um, platform, um, and before that, I'll talk about some elements of blockchains. I'll, I'll talk about um, some of the more stranger things that people claim you can make with um, blockchains, and I have a few concluding thoughts. So, uh, the impact of blockchain. So, as said earlier, um, if people have heard of blockchains, it's through the Bitcoin and, uh, and the various elements of that. Um, there are various claims that have been made. So, the World Economic Forum said that there'll be a tipping point for this technology in, in, um, in a few years. Uh, Santander say that they'll... Um, save $20 uh, uh, um, um, billion uh, dollars, uh, very soon. I, I go to a lot of blockchain events uh, where there are often a 1,000 people there, and you get two types of people. You usually get skinny teenagers who have their own startup and have some software and becoming rich, and then uh, who are building software, and then you get 10% are people in blue pinstripe suits from the banks hoping to make money. Um, so in terms of applications that I see out there, there's, there's been for a while a, a blockchain platform trading on the New York Stock Exchange in the shorts market. But we see a lot of uh, applications which are not in the financial area. So um, I'll say what blockchains can do uh, in, in a moment. Um, there's a company that has uh, 10 million diamonds on the blockchain. So one of the things that blockchains are good for is recording provenance. Now, the claim from this company is the only reason why anybody pays any money for a luxury good is because you know its provenance, you know its history. You know the diamond wasn't made yesterday in someone's garage. The painting wasn't um, painted by somebody uh, um, in some cellar. You know the complete history. And they're using it for diamonds to make sure they're not from war-torn torn areas. Um, there's a big connection between blockchains and what's called the Internet of Things putting physical objects on the internet. There was a, a demo from um, Visa and DocuSign for car leasing. And to caricature um, what they did is um, the car key and the car are on the blockchain. There are no forms to fill in. You simply walk in, they throw your car key to you. And as long as you keep paying funds from your bank account, your car key will work. And when you stop, your car key will not work. That's a different uh, way of thinking of things. Um, one thing one can do with blockchains is you can disintermediate. I may say more about that later. So you can, where any context where there's a middle player, you can take out the middle player and replace the trust that, that um, had. Um, another application of blockchains is in the energy sphere. So there were citizens um, in New York, uh, in Brooklyn, who have solar panels on their roof. And they're generating electricity, and they're selling that electricity to other citizens in New York with no energy company and no bank in between. So a, a, trust, a trusted mechanism for peer-to-peer um, -peer selling of electricity between um, citizens. Um, at the Open University, I have a movie that's showing now, we're using uh, blockchains, or beginning to use blockchains for storing your accreditation. So I may ask one of you, do you have any qualifications? And you say, yes, I have a degree from the University of Oxford. And if I say I don't believe you, what can you do? Do you have to run home, so hopefully you find a certificate? In a context of lifelong learning, this may not work. 
So what we're doing is we're putting micro-accreditation, so very fine-grained accounts of student accreditation onto the blockchain. Then we're matching that to jobs which are online. So I had another project where we have 5 million jobs in a particular computing area online. So as you sleep, your qualifications are automatically matching your skills to the skills for jobs. And then they're presented to you. The other thing we do is we, do, we find you jobs that you're nearly qualified for. And then we find you courses which will fill those skills gaps. So again, another ecosystem with a blockchain running where we're, we're removing the need for a, an intermediate, intermediary. Um, OK, so that's a very lightning overview of some applications. I'll now talk about some of the elements of the blockchain. Now I've um, increased your interest, hopefully. So a blockchain is simply a public ledger. It's a public record of transactions. And the reason why banks get interested, or have become interested in the blockchain, is because all the, blank, all the bank is, to caricature them, is a, is a ledger. They have databases, lots and lots of databases, to contain the ledger. And they spend um, a lot of resources overnight reconciling all their internal ledgers with the ledgers of, of others. So, um, um, and you need a complete record because, of course, your bank balance, unfortunately, isn't dependent on just your last transaction. It's dependent on all of your transactions. So that's why you need a ledger. Now, the reason why Santander think they'll save a lot of money is rather than spending a lot of effort in reconciling literally hundreds or thousands of databases of ledgers internally and with the other banks, there'll be one global source of truth that everyone can point to say, yes, that is the public record of our transactions and we all trust it. Um, I, I, this talk is not very technical, but I want to introduce some... Um, um, the definitions of some elements, just so you know um, if, you, if you read about them. So one is the cryptographic hash function, which you'll, be, uh, you'll hear about hashes if you, people tell you about blockchains. It's a very easy thing to define. So a hash function is you take a file of any size, it can be very small, it can be the size of a whole movie, and you hash it, it generates a file which is always small, a string of a fixed length which is not very big at all, if you change any element of the input file, just one pixel in the movie or one element of data, the hash completely changes. So the hash acts like a thumbprint of the document. Take a document of every size, create its thumbprint, the hash, and then you put that hash on the blockchain, which is very small. Then people can sign on it, and when you take out whatever it is your document you're interested in, you can say, my big document matches the thumbprint and the thumbprint was signed the hash. So that's what hashes do. Um, so a blockchain is simply a linked list. It's a list of blocks where every, every block points to the previous block, blocks through a hash. So one thing that gives you trust is the hash function. If I go back to some part of that history as the blocks and I make a change, the hash function will no longer work. The, the, the linked list will be broken. So then you can trust the whole blockchain because every block is pointed to with a hash function. So that's one thing that gives you trust. There are other elements that give you trust um, as well, which I'll talk about. Another thing is that it's peer-to-peer. -peer. So if you pull out your smartphone now or a, a tablet or a, um, a laptop and you run something online, the chances are you're connecting to a central database, a central server usually something like Google or Facebook. With a blockchain, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, which means if you're a main player in this space, everybody gets a complete record of the entire blockchain. So everybody can check what everybody else is doing to make sure that nobody else is behaving in a bad fashion. Um, if you do have a peer-to-peer -peer system, there's the problem of who's going to produce the next block? So we could imagine that, um, a scenario where all of us are on the blockchain. All of us have uh, a one node, and we all have a complete record. But somebody needs to produce the next block. How are we going to choose them? And there's um, what's called um, consensus mechanisms. So a way of having a way of choosing the next person, but making it somehow fair. Another term that you'll hear about is something called a consensus mechanism. And the main one that's used on, on platforms such as Bitcoin is proof of work. 
Proof of work is a way of getting um, um, entities that don't know each other to collaborate and trust each other, what's happening, because it's very hard to cheat. In many of the blockchains, such as Bitcoin, they're what's called public, which means anyone with a computer can join. So what they do is they, they have a cryptographic puzzle. So there's some puzzle that you have to solve, and the way they design the puzzle is the only way to solve it is to guess. So there's some seed called the nonce with a function, and you guess the x such that the function magically produces a small number. And then to make the puzzle harder, you just make the number smaller and smaller. So what happens is you have all these computers around the globe trying to solve the puzzle, and they keep guessing, and the numbers that come out are too big. And then at one point, somebody guesses right, and then they win the prize of producing the next block. So that's another element of trust. So to cheat, you would have to go back, recreate all the hashes, and resolve all the proof of work puzzles. And because they're hard to solve, you would have to solve them faster if it was the room, everyone else in the room. And that's another element that creates trust, because you, you cannot out-compute everybody else. OK, so it's basically proof of work is a way of stopping the one bad person or bad players uh, um, doing nasty things. And it's been mathematically proven as long as less than 50% of your um, colleagues, um, if, if less than 50% of them are bad, you're OK. Once more than 50% of them are bad, then you're not OK. But it's a pretty good way of ensuring trust. One um, negative side effect of this is something that, um, that's called Bitcoin mining. So you imagine all these machines trying to solve these puzzles, um, and everybody wants to create a new block. If you create a new block, you actually get a reward. On Bitcoin, you get a coin. So this is the largest Bitcoin miner, or it was some time ago, um, in the US. And you can see they have this big farm of machines. So you have all these machines doing these cryptographic puzzles. And it was computed at some point that I think Bitcoin is mm, maybe using more electricity than Ireland. And it's growing. So you see that's an issue. So people work on different consensus mechanisms that don't use electricity. I won't spend too much time on this. I'll go through this quickly. But proof of work is the most common. So who has the most computing power? Who can solve the puzzles? There are others. Um, um, who has the most capacity? The more disk storage you give, the bigger your chance of winning the prize. Um, proof of stake. You take some of your coins. You lock them away and say, I will never use them. The more coins you lock away, the, more, the greater your chance of producing the next uh, um, block. Um, um, proof of burn. I take some coins and I actually set fire to them, uh, literally. And then um, that gives me a stake. So this is all about, if you want to play in the game, prove that you're engaged. And that um, um, should make the bad people shy away, because they won't be as engaged as the others. There is uh, one of elapsed time, who's been waiting the longest. And then there are um, proof of authority networks, where um, these are not open anymore, but you only let certain machines go in. So certain banks, if they want to collaborate, may only let other banks go in. So these are called permissioned blockchains, as opposed to completely open blockchains. Anyone can join the party. Um, everything is controlled by accounts, so um, there are um, public and private keys. Um, I won't labour this, but your pub, you have, everyone has uh, two keys. Your public key you share with anyone, and that can be used to encrypt secret messages. You keep your private key in a secret place, and that's the key for unlocking anything that was encrypted. So anything that happens on the blockchain is always signed with somebody using their private key. So you know, in principle, who's carried out any transaction. I mean, so and that's another element of trust. Um, there's the most popular uh, blockchain platform after um, Bitcoin is Ethereum. Um, Ethereum has a couple of, uh, of um, interesting extra things. So I said that the blockchain is only a uh, public ledger. Ethereum adds another element. So it has um, two types of accounts. These normal accounts are transferring funds. And then it has what, something called a smart contract. So the interesting thing about a smart contract, it is, a way, it is a piece of code. So instead of putting data on the blockchain, they put a piece of code. And in principle, this code 
can um, embody any legal or financial contract. So then I have my blockchain running, and it can be running financial and legal contracts for me in a trusted fashion, transferring funds across the globe. And again, there are many interesting things that we can do that. So some of the applications that I mentioned previously, so for example, the one with the car and the car keys, was running with smart contracts. Uh, on top of that, people build applications as combinations of smart contracts. Instead of calling these apps, they're called dApps, with decentralized um, applications. Um, and then there are special browsers. So um, in a way that one can have a browser for browsing all your movies or browsing your applications, you can browse your dApps uh, in a special blockchain browser. OK, um, there's a great website um, called How to Avoid Pointless Blockchain Projects um, for the skeptical. Um, and it, it, this talks about the various things that you need for a blockchain. So as it, with anything, you do get some hype, and then people have tried to block, apply a blockchain to everything. So the main characteristics you need for when a blockchain will be useful, you, you should need to share data. If you don't want to share data, forget it. You should have multiple writers, so multiple people want to write that data. There should be an absence of trust. It's not the case that everybody trusts everybody else completely. And your transactions should interact, ideally. As I said, with your bank balance, it's the combination of transactions that gives you your bank balance, not just your last, last spend or last income. And then there should be a set of rules. It should not be completely anarchic. Some people should care about the rules and the assets that you're transferring, be they uh, coins or, or, or diamonds, etc. And something should back the assets, whether it's a community or whoever. Um, so a couple of the more outlandish um, elements um, that we have um, that people are working on with blockchains. Um, two of them I'll talk about are DAOs and ICOs. So um, a DAO is a distributed autonomous organization. So I have this blockchain, which everyone trusts. I have smart contracts. And these are running with no humans in the loop. And they're transferring assets. So some people are thinking, OK, I can create a company, a company that trades with no humans. Why do we need humans anymore? They're not always trustworthy. And this will, will run, and we can look at the record of what happens on the blockchain. So there was something called ZerthDAO, uh, um, which uh, uh, I guess over a year ago, which was acting like a venture capitalist running on the Ethereum blockchain. This had, at one point, $160 million worth of investment crowdfunded. And it was um, um, parceling that money out to various projects with no humans using smart contracts on the blockchain. There's an interesting um, um, uh, element where you can think about combining any physical object with a blockchain platform. So then one can think about turning any physical thing, maybe this theater, maybe a screen, into a company that trades, and it rents itself out. So you can think about a car leasing company with no humans on the loop. Uh, IBM had, a, they had a, um, a washing machine that would order its own powder when it ran out. And when it, thinks, when it thought it was going to break down, it would um, contact an engineer, pay the engineer for the work, carry on. Again, with no humans in the loop. So again, di different things one can think of. Um, ICOs are um, something in contrast to um, what you see on the stock exchange. So when somebody wants to set up a company, they have an initial public offering. So I say, I have a fantastic idea. I have a company. Why don't you invest? Please invest in me. People invest um, certain funds, and for that, they get shares in the future profit of the company. So you can think about the shareholders investing. And then some point later, you actually build your product, whatever it is, and then you start selling. Users pay you for those services. Now, in that context, you have two types of stakeholders, to caricature it. You have users paying for services, and you have stakeholders, which are somehow, in one aspect, you say, well, they're siphoning off the money for the initial uh, funds they put in. With the blockchain, there's something called an initial coin offering. So one interesting thing one can do with the blockchain is you can basically invent your own currency. So I can invent the John currency for my fantastic product, and I can say, you can buy the John currency. It's only, it only costs you five pounds. 
for every coin, for every John coin. You invest, you buy that, but it's really an investment because I don't have the service, but you trust me and my services will come in the future. So when my services come, users will pay for them and then all of the John coins you bought will be worth something. So then we have an ecosystem with users and somehow stakeholders and, and shareholders, but there aren't really any shareholders. So you can take out the middle player, it all runs on the blockchain, and um, there is no shareholder siphoning off. There are just different elements um, using the join coin, and the join coin stays in the whole ecosystem. Okay, so um, let me just um, have some closing remarks. So of course, this, some of what I've said maybe intentionally is a bit provocative, a bit outlandish, but think about the current world that you live in now where every time you take out your device, you're connecting to some central server that you've never seen, some database somewhere um, that you don't control. And there are some um, um, big companies now, big tech companies, that have a lot of data on you. Tim Berners-Lee, the um, Sir Tim Berners-Lee who invented the web, he had an article in Vanity Fair in August where he postulated that the web is now anti-human because of this over-centralization of data. And he's, in fact, working on technologies um, to alleviate this, and we're connecting to his software, to, to um, connected to our blockchain at the Open University. Um, there was a journalist in The Guardian who um, asked Google, please um, send me all the data you have about me. So Google had 5.5 gigabytes worth of data on him. Now, of course, you can change your settings in different ways, I assume that his settings weren't the most, uh, um, uh, at least res restrictive, but the, the Google knew everywhere he had been. They knew about his searches, including those deleted. They knew his activity on YouTube. Now, with the blockchain and other technologies, we can think about creating a different type of internet or web where the data is shared in a more equal fashion. Um, there's also a, another um, case where you can think about people suffering not for the over-centralization of data, but because there's a lack of data on them. Um, I read a statistic recently that 30% of citizens in the US cannot get credit because they have no work history and no uh, um, um, credit history. Um, in the UK, we can think about the Windrush scandal where people were deported, and one can view that problem as a problem of data. They didn't have the data to prove that they had been in the UK for every year for the last 50 years. The government actually burned some of the data, which didn't help. So you can think about alleviating some of the social justice issues around data, which may be exacerbated by data, through technologies such as the blockchain. Okay, thank you. Thank you, John. Um, we now have Sajida Zwari, blockchain engineer at Consensus. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sajida Zwari. I'm going to introduce myself briefly, and then we'll go to the core of the subject. So I'm a blockchain architect. I work at Consensus, one of the biggest companies in the blockchain ecosystem. Consensus is actually a flat company with no hierarchy, and it's aiming at uh, bringing blockchain solution to the world as well as innovating as a company itself. I'm also an engineer and a computer science PhD student. I work on critical data management and transmission over complex systems. And I have uh, numerous side projects, uh, one of which is Kidner, and I'm going to talk about it after. I'm also very involved in association and community. I organize hackathons. Uh, if you don't know what a hackathon is, uh, feel free to ask at the end. And my goal is to explain what blockchain is in the simplest terms possible. And also, since I'm here at the Royal Institution and I'm thankful for the invite, um, I want to uh, help create a bridge between academia and the developer world, which is in blockchain and Bitcoin community, sort of filled with cypherpunk and libertarian and people with alternative mindsets. So one of uh, the subjects we're gonna 
talk about, blockchain has been explained in a brilliant way by John, and I'm going to give you just a simple example uh, that summarizes this, and maybe you can use that example to explain blockchain to, I don't know, your children, your parents, your friends, you know, those who are allergic to math, but kind of interested into Bitcoin and blockchain. So we're going to take an example, uh, an example about a family. So you have a family with parents and four children. There is a very simple rule in that family. Everyone has to uh, wash the dishes at least once a week. Parents, they have um, some sort of attributes. First, they have authority over the children. They can supervise their work. They can ask uh, them questions, and children has to, they have to answer their parents. But also, they can use some sort of pressure system, like rewards, punishments, ice creams, things like that. OK, so we have still a problem, trust, in this family. What if the sister says that she has done her duty, but actually it's her brother that did it? How can we tell, how can the parents tell who is lying and who is not? So at the end of the day, they still have to play police and actually monitor the children. And this is very tiring. So the question is, <laughs> yes, how to help parents? Well, actually, blockchain is the answer. I know. So they go to the supermarket, they buy a blockchain. Yes, you can find it everywhere. So it is basically just a transparent tube, and you put it in your kitchen floor with some cement around it. You give, <laughs> I'm giving you the recipe of blockchain. You give some tokens to your children, each color for one child, and you give them a padlock and a key. So why is that? If you think about everything you just heard about blockchain, actually, this is a metaphor of what blockchain is. The transparency of the tube is important because in the blockchain, public blockchains, everything is transparent. You can actually read every transaction on that ledger that is replicated on every node of the peer-to-peer -peer network. This is one of the greatest attributes of blockchain. The second is, is the cement. We've been talking about hashes earlier, hash function, the thing that actually links every block in the blockchain and make it not corruptible. This is the cement. You cannot take the tube and shake it or remove some of the tokens of the children. Each token is like a transaction or a block, if you want. And then the padlock and the key is the cryptographic elements. Cryptography is one of the core elements of blockchain. You cannot interact on a blockchain if you cannot sign your transaction. So you need your public and private key to do so, to express yourself, and no one else can do it, because no one else has your private key, which is why every, every time you will hear about blockchain, the first advice is don't lose your private key, because if you lose your private key, you lose everything, especially your bitcoins, and it happens a lot of time. I don't know if you heard about that man that went into uh, garbage trying to look for the hard drive when he had some private key, because now he's a millionaire, but actually he's not. So. So this uh, tube was actually built, and uh, it was um, showed at a hackathon I organized in 2016. Designers worked on it. They have no technical background, but they were able to build this metaphor, which is that the sister and brother are actually society. We have millions of sister and brother that are trying to collaborate, to work together, but they cannot always trust each other. So what do we do? We add third parties, we add middlemen, we add authorities. And after that, they take everything, they take the value. Think about Uber. I don't know if you had the same issue in the UK as we had in France, but it was almost a revolution. People were burning tires in the subway, um, in the autoroute, uh, in highway, actually. They were actually throwing things at people, customer from the Uber. So it went very bad. Why? Because they felt like they've been losing their job. And why is that? Because Uber um, basically took over the market. But at the same time, the drivers, they could have organized an Uber um, in the form of the DAO, for example, and say, OK, we have the cars, we have the expertise, we have the network, we have the clients. Why do we need someone else? But they didn't do that. They kept doing the same way. And Uber added an added value with a better algorithm. And now they control, they own the driver, they own the margin, they calculate everything, and nobody can say nothing. So every time you don't take let's say, your own face into your hands, then you're letting room for someone else to do it. OK. So why is blockchain interesting? Because blockchain, it is not just a new tech. It is not a software. It's nothing. 
like that. It's a social and technical paradigm shift. It's a new way of building things. And it's not just about finance. It's not just about Bitcoin and darknet and speculation and greed and everything we like to read about in the newspaper. It's just like the internet. When the internet was born, it started quite slowly. People, they didn't have even understand what was the internet. Uh, I recommend you to watch some old video about people talking about what is internet on TV shows and like things like that is super funny. They don't even know what they're talking about. This is us right now talking about blockchain. And we have to be patient because it took years for us to have like concrete application of what is internet and what it brings to us. So it's going to happen in the same way with blockchain. And the good news is, is that it's happening way faster. So now I'm going to focus on one aspect, which is actually a good transition with what we've seen at the end of the last presentation about centralization of data and the question of self-sovereignty on our own data. So do you really own the data you produce? I did a presentation at a technical conference a few months ago, and the title was, Who Owns You? So I asked this question. Nobody told me anything. So the answer is no one. That's the answer. No, nobody own, owns you. But in the reality, some big players of the digital ecosystem owns you because they own your data. They know everything about you. People, they are afraid of hackers. I don't know, like some kind of uh, myth of, I mean, it's not a myth, but it's like a minority of uh, the threats that you're living in, uh, like Russian hackers, you know, like East European hackers entering everywhere. But this is not the biggest threat. The biggest threat is the data that you're actually giving, um, like, you are giving it, nobody is actually forcing you or breaking into your computer to, get, to make you give it. And this is when you use WhatsApp, when you use Instagram, when you use Google, when you use all these friendly applications, but actually these are toxic friends because they are sucking everything from you and they are not giving you anything back. You're completely out of the value chain here. So let's take a look at this text. This is a piece of terms and condition from Instagram. And just uh, the second paragraph is like the translation in human language, because, you know. So what Instagram is telling you is that, OK, so you own your original pictures and video, but we are allowed to use them, and we can let others use them as well anywhere, in, anywhere around the world. And other people might pay us to use them, and we will not pay you for that. Awesome, right? <laughs> Great. And what do we do? Every time we download an app, we press yes. Why? Because we need the service. So we are in a paradigm that is very simple, and I don't know why we believe it's how things should be, where when we need a service, we are ready to sacrifice our data to have it. And sometimes we pay. This is like a double punishment. So let me introduce you to some of my research work. I've been asking myself two questions how to give back to the user control over its data, and how to reconcile transparency and confidentiality in a decentralized environment. You have now understand the hope that is in blockchain, the promise, but I believe that if we don't solve the confidentiality situation, it's going to be not as spectacular of a revolution as we want. One case study that I'm going to talk about is in my project, Kidner, which is a decentralized matching platform for kidney transplants. So first, critical data. What are they? So we can find them everywhere. It's personal data, medical data, uh, crisis data, business data, bank data. And I don't know if you know that, but take a look at this. The data that are the most expensive and the most uh, searched for by malicious person are medical data. I don't know if you knew that. So that's scary. So Kidner is about using blockchain in a healthcare environment, which is kind of the worst thing if you're building a startup or an entrepreneurship project to start with because of the, all the legal complication and ethical complication. But I believe if we can solve this, we can solve everything. So I'm going to introduce you to the concept of Kidner, which is cross-donation. So we have Bob and Alice, like always. So Bob needs a kidney, he's a recipient. Alice wants to give Bob her kidney, she's a donor. Unfortunately, Bob and Alice are not compatible. What that means is that this transplant cannot happen. This might be the end of the story for them. Okay, then we have Carol and Dave on the other side, maybe on another, in another country. 
same situation there. What they don't know, because it doesn't exist today, what they don't know is that actually Alice and Carol are compatible and Dave and Bob are compatible. And you will only know that if we have a pool of pairs of incompatible donor and recipients on a connected network with algorithms that can run to find matches, right? So how do we create that? To create that, you need a network of hospitals that are willing to collaborate, but they don't want to because medical data is sensitive and also data in general is sort of precious. So people, they don't want to share that. So blockchain here, I'm using it to solve a governance issue, meaning that there is no, not one hospital that is the authority on the other hospital. There is not one place where data are stored, like for example, in the US, what about patients in France or Europe? Or So if you don't uh, remove these roadblocks, nothing is going to happen just on a political level. So with blockchain, there's nothing such as this because every hospital is going to run its own node and store its own data. Second thing, matching algorithm. We need to do computation in a decentralized fashion. We can do that with blockchain. We've seen it with Ethereum. It is the perfect platform to run decentralized application. We also call them unstoppable application because no one can actually kill the process. Now, the third aspect of this project is cryptography. So I'm working on a crypto system such as homomorphic encryption, or multi-party computation, and basically what, does, what it does, it enables you to compute and perform calculation on data that you cannot see, on encrypted data. We call it also blind computation. Um, with my team, we're building a platform called Hellhound, and it is a decentralized platform for blind computation. Any startup, any company, anyone can use Hellhound, send some encrypted data, send an algorithm, and we're able to send back the results, we don't know what the result is, we don't know what the inputs are, but we're able to send back the results so that it is decrypted by the end user. If you think about that, that means that we don't have any more to do the sacrifice I was talking about earlier. Now we can use, for example, 23andMe for the genetics, you know, the DNA testing. You can use that, but you don't have to give your DNA information to 23andMe that is going to build the biggest DNA database, which is something very scary, I think, of the world and you have actually to pay for that just to know who is your third degree cousin, you know? So if you use that, that means that you can go and do your own DNA tests, you can encrypt your file, own it, send it to such platform, and get back the result, and you never disclose any information about yourself. This is self-sovereignty. This is what blockchain can bring to our uh, IT system and services right now. So, yeah, if we have time, I'm going to show you this uh, video about the Kidner project. So this video was done uh, for a hackathon that we actually, uh, we actually won in May. And it was the Blockchain for Social Impact hackathon. So here you see uh, two persons, one is the donor, one is the recipient.
thank you for watching. Um, so, thank you. So I'm just going to let you look at this, but so basically what we're trying to achieve with Kidner is proof that technology can actually help save lives and have an impact. We already have like a prototype that is working. You can see it here. This is not like the best front end you've ever seen, but this, <laughs> this proves that it can work. And we've been in contact with doctors and chief of nephrology services. They are very interested in the uh, projects as uh, well as the WHO, uh, who contacted me personally to work on how blockchain can help prevent uh, kidney trafficking, let's say kidney traceability if we turn it in a positive way. But I can tell you that organ uh, trafficking in organ tourism is massive. So, if you want to learn more about Kidner, we have a website, kidnerproject.com, uh, and uh, we have been featured in the Telemedicine and eHealth Society journal. So, moving on. We've been through the hope. Not, let's talk about the hype. So, now that we're seeing about blockchain, it is a great technology that can help us achieve many things, but we cannot put blockchain everywhere. Unfortunately, that's what people have been doing, and this is why people are kind of distrust, distrusting this technology, uh, because they're seeing too much um, announce a newspaper article telling about what blockchain can solve. Uh, you know that a company just added blockchain in their uh, product title and uh, their valuation increased 100%. So, I can understand how this can send bad signals. But let's just take a look at how we can find a good use case. So, for that, you need a metal methodology. So, I'm just going to let you take a look at this, but yeah, you, you laugh, but that's what's going on in companies. I've been to meetings pretty much like that. So. so okay, so if we take a look at the hype curve of Gardner, uh, we are pretty much at the, at the peak, but it has been going on for years, so now I don't even know if we are just going to be in hype for years and years, or if it's just, I don't know, normal for blockchains. What we do know is that they're here to last. It is not just... Uh, a short-term thing, it is going to impact your life in the future, so no one can um, not take a look at this now. I wrote an article, very easy to read, called Blockchain is the Answer, but what was the question? Sure. So, a few tips I'm giving you. You start from your use case. You all have um, like expertise in the field. You all have pain points you want to solve. So just take a look at that and see how you can leverage the value proposition of the blockchain that now you know to uh, solve these pain points. You have to know the possibilities and the limits of a technology. Blockchain is not going to solve everything, not at all, but it can solve some things. But if you are aware of that, now you can propose relevant use cases to your company or to your own startup. You can download a tool, it's free. I've done it after compiling knowledge and questions from hackathons I've been mentoring. Uh, it's called the Blockchain Canva, looks like this. It's pretty intuitive, it's like the Blockchain Model Canva but for a block, uh, business model Canva but for a blockchain use case. Um, remember the slide that John showed you about the question you need to ask yourself? That's pretty much the same idea. If you're able to fill all these spaces, it means that you are probably on a very good use case. And then you can use this to brainstorm more and maybe specify your use case. So it is really a tool that you can use on your own or with your team. This is an example of the Kidner project. Just with this canvas, I can explain everything about the Kidner project I just show you, just with one slide. So, as a conclusion, hope and hype, that's my answer for you. Why? Because actually it's not about blockchain, it's about humans. Blockchain is neutral, it's a technology, right? It's humans who put expectation in blockchain. It's humans who can use blockchain for good or bad things. So, we'll see what we do with that. Also, blockchain won't solve all our problems, and certainly not alone. What, does, what it means is that you can use blockchain to create a solution, but you will for sure have to use other tools. If you take a look at the blockchain uh, Kidner project, you've seen that I've used cryptography, because blockchain on its own could not be viable for this use case because of the confidentiality issue. Blockchain has also a scalability issue. 
It has many issues, but the good thing is we have to be patient because the paint is still fresh. I don't know if we say that in English, but we do say it in French. So it means that we have to wait because people are working on this. Uh, researchers are on it, developers are on it. Ethereum Foundation, for example, is working on uh, removing some roadblocks on the Ethereum blockchain. And mistakes. Mistakes were made and they are going to be made. Uh, the DAO, I don't think we have time to dive into this, but yes, that was a good example. Um, money was stolen, they did a rollback on the blockchain, basically breaking some of the promises of this technology, but also saving the credibility of the technology so that it can have a future. So again, a trade-off. And mistakes will always be made because people still have to learn how to handle blockchain uh, solutions. Uh, you, I think, have the habits, if you lose your password, to click on, I forgot my password, right? We sometimes do that. We, you don't do that with blockchain. If you've lost your private key, it's lost forever. All your millions are lost forever. There's no one you can call. There's no support service that can help you. This is very disturbing for people who are not used to this. So it's not like it's going to go mainstream in the year, but people are developing some platform, developing some solution, and you should be looking at it right now. I could talk forever about the use cases that are actually running. I'm not talking about things that are going to be released, but things are actually existing right now, and it's happening. So it's better not to miss the train, like we say in France, too. Thank you very much.